Welcome everyone back to the second day of our National Science Board meeting. The first session of this morning is the Committee on Oversight. I'd like to turn to Anila Sargent. Anila, I believe you're on mute. So we're ready to begin with the Committee on Oversight, turning to Anila Sargent. It looks like her screen is frozen. Um, so she may have lost connectivity. I see her there right next to me in the um, gallery view. And yet she seems immobile and silent. Yeah, I tried to unmute her and I could not unmute her, I, unmute her either. Anila? It looks like she's reconnecting. She is. Uh, yes, I am. I, there, were, there were some. I. We're only getting every other word, so it may be important to maybe call in the audio on your phone. Well, let's try again. See if the. All right. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I've got a little message that says my connection is unstable. Um, and there's not much I can do about that, but I'm, I'm doing my best here. Yes, it didn't, it worked completely yesterday. So I'm hoping that we can ooh, just come back. Only everything, of course, is now onto the panel. If, um, if you turn off your video, it'll help. If you turn off the video, it'll help with your connection. Really? Okay. Um, well, that's okay then. Um, I'll just do that. You won't use as much bandwidth. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Good. Yes, okay, well, lovely. I'll do Then I'll, I'll try, let me try with the, I'll, I'll try with the video. Um, oh, it says my host has stopped it. Oh, well, <clears throat> I would have preferred to look at, but never mind. <clears throat> so I'm sorry about that. Um, oh, shoot. But, um, so as a result of that, everything that was all set up a few minutes ago is no longer set up. I apologize. Um, okay, so I'd like to welcome everyone um, to the Committee on Oversight session. And as we start the second day of the meeting, I've been asked to repeat the Zoom meeting ground rules. Um, so board members, please use your video. All others, please leave your video off unless you're speaking. And everyone should mute their audio when they're not speaking and use either the hand raise icon in the participants list or enter into the chat box to ask a question or make a comment. And this will be monitored. Um, if you have questions beyond clarifying questions, please say them, save them until the end of each presentation. And when called on, unmute your audio and identify yourself. During this Committee on Oversight session, um, Executive Secretary Karen Gambarini will watch for raised hands and monitor the chat box. She will let me know at appropriate junctures if there are any questions or comments. So, First, um, let me take a roll call when I, of the committee members. When I state your name, could you just respond? John Anderson? Here. Roger Beachy? Here. Stephen Leith? I'm here. Carol Leinberger? Carl? Maybe not yet. Bud Peterson? Carl is here. He was just muted. OK. Bud Peterson? Bud, Bud Peterson's here. Stephen Willard. Here. And so let's move on to committee business. I'm trying to move on rather quickly to get it on with that to the business. Um, I request formal approval of the minutes of our February 2020 open session meeting. They can be found in tab 13.2 of the board book. Are there any corrections to the open session minutes? Well, unless people are I'm going to say that the minutes stand approved as presented. Now, later in this session, 
we're going to hear updates from the NSF's Inspector General, Alison Lerner, and from the Chief Financial Officer, Teresa Grankovitz. But first, I'd like to provide a brief update on the merit review activities. And so for the new board members, I should explain that Congress has asked the NSB to oversee the integrity of the process used by NSF to determine how research funds are selected for funding by the foundation. The Committee on Oversight takes the preliminary responsibility for carrying out this annual assessment of the merit review process and then presents its findings to the board for approval. NSF in turn provides the committee and the board with an annual collection of relevant data called the Merit Digest, which the committee reviews along with other information. The 2018 Merit Review Digest was completed and was distributed more widely than ever before. It was even featured in the American Institute of Physics March newsletter. It has been downloaded from the website substantially more than in prior years. And staff are now tracking online readership and they will share these metrics after the 2019 Digest is released. Meanwhile, for this year's um, activities, the Office of Integrative Activities staff has informed me that a draft of the 2019 digest will be ready for the Oversight Committee review in June. That is to say, it'll be ready in June. Uh, OIA anticipates that a, the online module that provides information about the Committee of Visitors evaluations will be available on a similar timescale. And a draft module on the results of NSF's latest biennial survey of principal investigators and reviewers will follow in July. Ideally, the Oversight Committee will review the 2019 Digest and present it to the board for approval before the July meeting. And then based on the digest and the other materials that are being prepared, the committee hopes to present a draft of the 2019 board overview for approval at the July meeting. Um, that is more iffy, I should say. This timeline would bring us back to the schedule of reporting merit review data for each year in a digest that is published in the immediately following year and should optimize the usefulness of the digest in, for future uh, years. And again, for the benefit of new members, um, the overview that I'm talking about um, is really was added recently by the board to, uh, for the new digest. It allows the NSB to highlight interesting trends in the digest data and note areas where there are opportunities for NSF and NSB to address broader issues. One recent result is that the Vision 2030 report includes a suggestion based on discussions that went into um, completing that uh, board overview, it reports a suggestion that NSF and NSB could make considerable use of the merit review process and better in this way, better address some of the societal needs that the vision report um, points out. Um, I'm not going to go in any further um, to this at the moment, but there were particular recommendations or, or suggestions in the overview that actually bear on some of the issues that the vision report raised. And I think that there is, as I said yesterday, a real um, opportunity for give and take between the uh, board and the NSF staff to improve how we attack some of these problems. So I conclude my remarks, of course, by asking you to celebrate with me what I see as the impressive steps forward that the NSF has taken over the last few years to improve in more ways than I can count, um, how the merit review process is presented to all its stakeholders. We now have a focused, accessible, easily navigable online document that incorporates links and enables easy downloading and exploration of the underlying data. 
as more researchers and policymakers receive and read the digest, as well as our um, base of um, PIs, of course, um, the NSF's exceptional conduct of the merit review process should become more and more appreciated. I sincerely thank all of the OIA staff for their immense commitment of effort to this project. I've been advised not even to try to name names because not only were the current staff there, but we have had rotating through individuals who have brought their own particular talents at each stage of the process and have moved us forward immeasurably. It's been a wonderful experience uh, to work with the OIA staff. I'm also grateful to the members of the Committee of Oversight and to the Merit Review Task Force members. I'd especially like to call out John Anderson, who chaired this committee before me and worked with NSF to begin the transformation that we are now seeing. So Karen, I think this is a point where I could ask you, are there any questions or comments that I should respond to? Daniela, I'm not seeing any questions or comments at this time. Okay, so that when we can move right on. So again, my grateful thanks to all of the OIA staff for everything they've done to improve the merit review um, digest. So moving on to other items. Um, again, for new members, the board is required to submit the OIG's semi-annual report on its activities along with the NSF management response to Congress twice a year at the end of May and November. Again, the NSB has delegated initial authority to the Committee on Oversight to generally supervise the OIG, including the review of the semi-annual report. In practice, the committee reviews the report to determine if there is a need for further discussion on any matter. The committee also reviews and recommends full board approval of the NSF management response. And so having told you what we're doing, <laughs> I'm going to tell you why we're not doing it right now. <laughs> because this meeting is so early in May, the Office of Inspector General semi-annual report and the NSF man management response for the period ending March 31, 2020 are not yet available um, for review. Both will be emailed to all the committee members within the next few days for review and recommendation so that they may be forward to the full board for approval. And with that, I turn to the updates from the Inspector General and the Chief Financial Officer. Um, Inspector General Alison Lerner will now brief us on the OIG's recent activities. Due to time constraints, the audit presentation normally given by the contractor Kearney and Company has been included in the board book for re review under this tab. And so I'm going to ask you to give your presentation, um, Alison. Thank you. Thank you, Anila, and good morning to everyone. Um, I want to start by speaking to the impact of the move to remote working on OIG operations. Fortunately for us, that impact has been minimal as we were 100% telework ready. Most work is proceeding normally, although, uh, it, and if we've had any impact at all, you know, a few things are moving slower. Um, if, if we have impacts down the road, I'll update you on those at future board meetings. We've been able to keep our work flowing in, in no small part because so many of our workflows have already been digitized or made electronic. We've had to make slight tweaks to others. For example, we're now signing subpoenas and some letters with digital signatures. We've sworn out a warrant um, via FaceTime for a case in another state. And we're also using Zoom for interviews. I wanna um, give kudos to my staff uh, during Public Employee Recognition Week, who have brought all of their creativity and passion for the work to the task of accomplishing their responsibilities in this remote environment. Technology doesn't get you through problems like this, your people do. And my staff have been at their best during these challenging times. And 
I wanted to note that because we are all affected by the pandemic, not just professionally, but personally, um, we understand its impact on the people that we work with as we pursue our audit and investigative ob objectives. And we're committed to working with those folks to accomplish our goals, but to find ways to do so that ensure their ability to maintain their safety and health. Uh, finally, I want to give kudos to Wanda Gardner, to Javier Inclan and the IRM crew for all of the incredible techno technological support that they provided us as we made this move. Uh, the, the tools that NSF has that facilitate uh, remote working and the robustness of its IT infrastructure have made this transition so much easier than the, the, the ones some of my colleagues are experiencing at other, other agencies. And I, I'm very grateful for that. It wouldn't have been possible for us to do what we did without that underlying infrastructure. I have three updates on OIG work. First, as, as, as Neela noted in your board books, you have the uh, FY 2020 audit plan from Carney and Company, the contractor that is doing the financial statement and FISMA audits for this year. Um, Carney is continuing its work during the pandemic, but trying to do so in a way to allow NSF management the flexibility to prioritize its health, safety, and mission critical work. It's able to do that by building on its experience performing these engagements over the last four years and by continuing its commitment to communication, collaboration, and cooperation during the course of the work. Um, the next thing I wanted to move to is a, a brief discussion of the impact of the CARES Act on, on our office. The CARES Act, as I know you all recognize, provided $76 million in funding to NSF, among other things. But it, uh, what I want to speak to is the oversight and transparency requirements that, that come along, that, that accompanied that, that funding. There are many, many oversight and uh, transparency requirements in the act, um, many of which are based on uh, similar provisions in the Recovery Act back in 2009. Among other things, the, the CARES Act created a pandemic response accountability committee within the Council of Inspectors General for Integrity and Efficiency that is meant to be similar to what the Recovery Board did during the Stimulus Act. And uh, it is the 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 PRAC, as it's referred to, is responsible for coordinating um, oversight of uh, within the IG community of the CARES Act funding and the COVID-19 response. It's also responsible for standing up a public facing website. It had 30 days to do so from the enactment of the, of the CARES Act. And that, that website went live last week. You can find it at pandemic.oversight.gov. And uh, all reports done by OIGs and by the Government Accountability Office that focus on the COVID-19 funding and response will be posted on that website. Uh, there's also a hotline for people to uh, provide concerns to and uh, many other special uh, bits, special features to that website, which is a work in progress. As you can imagine with 30 days to stand it up and running, we have uh, improvements that we're in the process of making right now, but you can go in there, you can see planned work from many OIGs, you can see some completed work, and uh, over time, you'll also be able to see recommendations related to that work. I would close by noting that um, the, the, the CARES Act also brings with it many other requirements to display data related to, to the actual expenditure of CARES Act funding. Again, a, similar to what we saw with the Recovery Act in the early part in, in 2009. I'll let Teresa speak more to that, uh, but uh, and that is a work in process as well. Um, because uh, of, of just the, the many details that need to be worked out between the Office of Management and Budget, the Treasury Department, and uh, the OIG committee. Finally, I would note that uh, I have been asked by the chair of the Council of Integrity and Efficiency to serve as a member of the PRACT, and I'll be doing that moving forward. Um, 
I'll close by noting a recent settlement that our office uh, entered into. In April of this year, a Rice University paid the government more than $3.7 million to resolve claims that it engaged in a pattern and practice of mischarging NSF awards. In a nutshell, from 2006 to 2018, Rice allegedly budgeted for graduate students uh, in proposals for NSF funding, but in and ultimately used that money to have to pay those students to do teaching that had nothing to do with the NSF award that didn't benefit the award and therefore was not allocable to or, or allowable to that award. Uh, the university made then false false certifications with the proposals and with requests for payment um, as a result of the, that those activities. To settle those allegations, Rice paid $3.75 million, which is double the amount of the loss to the government. It's important to note that the settlement resolved the claims without a determination of liability. And I want to commend uh, Maureen Weir, Pam Van Dort, and Shiji Thomas of my office for their uh, incredible work over the the several years that it took to bring this case to uh, to the settlement that I just described. And I'm happy at this point to take any questions y'all might have. Thank you, Allison. And I think we'd all like to congratulate you on your appointment, uh, your new committee appointment. We were delighted to hear about that. It's wonderful to have someone like you in place. So Thanks are there, so I, I don't think there are any questions. No, Anila, we have a, a question from Steve Willard. Oh, yes, we do. I see that now. Thank you. Thank you for catching me, Karen. Okay, Steve. Yeah, Allison, I'd, I'd like to, to join in the congratulations to you. I mean, I really appreciate the fact that you go beyond just excellence at the NSF to be a leader in the entire government community. And um, I wanted to let you know that I've been um, in my day job dealing with the CARES Act as well. So if you'd care to get together by telephone, we can compare notes about the CARES Act. Thank you. Any further questions? Well, thank you again, Allison. That was very succinct and we're moving through <laughs> and I'm really pleased. So now I'd like to ask um, Teresa to join us, Teresa Grankovic, the NSF's Chief Financial Officer. She's going to update the committee on major events in the financial area. And some of her information has already been provided and is actually available on the portal, but we'll get a nice summary from her now. Teresa. Yes, good morning. Thank you, good Dr. Morning. Good morning. Yes, thank you, Dr. Sargent. My written CFO update is in the board book, and I will provide a few quick updates on this written report. As Wanzi mentioned yesterday, our offices have been working very closely together and with all our colleagues across NSF to respond to this pandemic appropriately and quickly. As was highlighted, BFA has taken swift action to provide guidance to our external community on the NSF implementation of the OMB guidance to federal grant making agencies. This guidance is available on, a, on the NSF external website by clicking the COVID information link under the alert banner. This information page is frequently updated and also includes FAQs, COVID research items and fact sheets and blog posts. The BFA response to COVID-19 pandemic item an attachment in the board book gives more details on this guidance. BFA has conducted virtual outreach to the community to provide assurances we are all on the job to deliver continued support and information. BFA quickly worked to get access to the CARES Act supplemental funding, allocated the funds to the directorates, assisted in creating spending controls, and is obligating the rapid and eager awards. As of this morning, over 60% or over 45 million of this CARES Act funding has been obligated and committed. As Allison mentioned, we are moving forward with our financial statement and FISMA audits while prioritizing the health and safety of staff and the mission work of the agency. 
We will continue to work together with OIG and Kearney for the ongoing success of these audits. At the beginning of the pandemic, I framed my expectations with my leadership team and staff that their health and well being was our number one priority, followed by mission accomplishment and then finding creative ways to do meaningful work, which includes working on these audits. As always, the BFA team has surpassed my expectations and have developed innovations to improve accomplishment of their work and provide increased value to NSF. As Allison also mentioned, the CARES Act has reporting requirements and OMB is planning to use the current Data Act files to meet these requirements. NSF has been working closely with OMB and Treasury to provide input on options for meeting the proposed monthly reporting guidelines and abbreviated timelines. We have a meeting with GAO next week. It will be a follow-up meeting for the agency data governance and data quality engagement and an entrance conference for monitoring and oversight of response to the COVID-19 pandemic. As I mentioned, the Data Act is expected to be the reporting mechanism for the CARES Act, and both GAO and, as Allison mentioned, OIG has mandates to provide oversight of these funds. So we, we are working proactively with them to provide the information they need to carry out their responsibilities. And regarding um, enterprise risk management, if the agenda permits, we're still planning to brief you on our ERM, ERM efforts at the July NSB meeting. So thank you, and I will take any questions. Well, at the moment, I can't see any questions. We can wait for a moment or two. Oh, there's a question from Steve Willard. Hello, Steve. Teresa. Hello, um, Steve. How are you doing? Good, thank you. Um, so just so we have 76 million of new money, do the new CARES Act requirements only apply to that and are you segregating the 76 or are they trying to bootstrap the CARES requirements onto everything we do? Um, the, the CARES Act is specifically to the, the 76 million. Um, we do have a special code that not only segregates the funding from this emergency supplement, but also that um, shows us what our regular appropriations were using on the COVID response and that's part of the negotiation with OMB and Treasury on the Data Act reporting is that we do we report everything every month or mm -hmm. do we do a separate file with just the supplemental funding? So all that stuff we're working out and that's where the abbreviated timelines come into. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you. So, well, thank you again, Teresa. It was very reassuring. So now I'd just like to close by saying some sad things. Um, we have to say goodbye to John Anderson and Bud Peterson from our committee. Bud has uh, served many years on this and during his 12 years on the board and John over the last six. They've both contributed greatly both to the board and to the committee on oversight. Um, both of them or each of them has chaired the committee in turn. And as already mentioned, John was the initial driving force behind the transformation of the Merit Review Report, now the Merit uh, Review Digest. And moreover, under Bud's leadership of this committee, the communications among the board, the Inspector General's office and the CFO's office were all greatly improved and expanded. And as a result became, I believe, much more productive than they had been in the past. And I really thank you for the, that particular um, management, uh, but it was just wonderful. Thank you. And so we will miss you. And uh, I don't know who will miss you as chair anymore because this is also um, my, the end of my term as chair. So we'll have to see how things uh, go on. But as a result, I'd just like to say what, how, ex what a wonderful experience it has been to chair the Committee on Oversight, which I know can sound very 
daily bread boring when we report, but it's something that I think has now changed to something that everyone can access and see what the great work that we do here is. So this concludes our session and thank you everyone. And I believe we may even have gathered some time back that we lost for very good reasons um, in the chat room. So thank you again. Anila, Stephen Willard has raised his hand. I, Excuse I me. Oh. I apologize, boss, um, but I didn't know that you that uh, there might be transitions. You have been a joy to work with in the two years on your committee, and I wanted to particularly mention you together with your merit review process. You have totally illuminated what I have said. I think is one of the crown jewels of the NSF. And but for you, it not would not have been done and it wouldn't have been done one tenth as well. So thank you so much, particularly for the merit review process. I want to echo Steve's thanks to Anila for chairing this committee and doing it so well. I have to say I was very excited by your merit review digest um, report out at the beginning. That's something I've cared about throughout the time I've been on the board, and it's just so wonderful to see it reach fruition. Um, thanks also to Allison and, and Teresa for your presentations, and to all the members of the Committee on Oversight for a wonderful job done during this two-year cycle. It's been a great, a great performance. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. So we can turn now to the Committee on Awards and Facilities. Diane, I think Bud had a comment. Ah, please, Bud. Well, I was just going to thank Anila for her leadership uh, and say that the uh, my time with this group uh, has been anything but boring. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> well, I think you were saying, Anila, yesterday that um, when you took on the committee chairmanship, you weren't sure that this was the right fit for you, but you certainly made it a right fit. and. Uh, it's, it has worked very well. Here, here. So let's turn now to the Committee uh, on Awards and Facilities. Uh, Diane? Yes. Uh, ANF is not scheduled to start until 11.45, um, so we should take a, a 10 minute break. Um, Perfect, that will be good for all of our health. I, I hardly recommend that everyone stand up and stretch and before we sit back down, people can also go to the breakout room if you're a board member, if you'd like, and we will start at 11.45. Thank you.
Okay, are, are we ready to start? I don't think everyone's here yet, Carl. Okay, I'm trying to get time, as you can tell. All right, I think that we are currently ready to begin the session of the Committee on Awards and Facilities. Carl. Thank you very much, Diane. Uh, I, as Diane obviously gave away, have Carl Einberger, Chair of the Committee on Awards and Facilities. And in this Zoom format, I'm going to ask uh, Ju Judy Hayden, our Executive Secretary, one of them, to call the role of committee members. Judy. I'd like to call the roll, Artie Benenstock. Here. Vicki Chandler. Here. Kent Fox. Here. I'm sorry, Kent sorry. is here. Yeah, Kent is here. Okay, sorry. James Jackson. Uh, I'm here. Daniel Reed. Maybe he's not back in yet. Anelia Sargent. Here. Alan Stern. I'm here. Diane Savane. Here. Alan Ochoa. Here. Okay. And I can go back to, um, who did I miss? Daniel Reed. I think he had to step out briefly. Okay. Okay, so shall I proceed? Mm -hmm. Okay, so in this morning's open session, we have two items on the agenda. We will start with a briefing on COVID-19 impacts on our major facilities, and then we'll turn to a written update on the Ocean Observatory's initiative Materials associated with these items are available in the ANF open tab in the diligent board uh, book. Plans are underway now for the annual ANF committee retreat on July 27th and 28th, immediately prior to the July board meeting. I ask us all to get these items, uh, get this uh, date into your calendar so that you can't be taking your trip around the world uh, at that time. Uh, anyhow, uh, at this uh, retreat, new board members of all flavors and current board members who are interested in becoming more involved with a &F are also warmly invited to participate. We're still working on the details, but expect to have fruitful conversations with Jim Wolfestad, our Chief Officer for Research Facilities and those NSF staff who work with major facilities uh, concerning agency level strategies and processes. Now, before going further, I'd like to welcome Jonathan Wynn to the ANF staff team. Jonathan, are you there? Yes, thank you for the welcome. Uh, good. Um, Jonathan is now a part of this really wonderful team of, ex of executive secretaries. And for those of you who don't know Jonathan, uh, he's a geologist and a program officer in uh, GEO's Division of Earth Sciences. We're really looking forward to working with you. Let's move to the approval of prior minutes and uh, the minutes from our February open meeting are in the board book. Does anyone have additions, deletions, or amendments? Seeing no hands, hearing no sounds, uh, I, I, the minutes stand approved as presented. Okay. In terms of planned actions and context items, in your board book, you'll find a rolling calendar year schedule of planned actions, con context, and information items. You'll notice that since the February meeting, 
a number of information items related to COVID-19 have been added to the schedule for the July and November meetings. Are there any comments or questions about the calendar? Okay. We now turn to the first item in the session, a presentation on the COVID-19 impacts on NSF funded major infrastructure and construction projects. Before I turn the committee uh, let's try that again. Before I turn things over to Jim Olastad, our CORF, I'd like to thank him for keeping the committee so well briefed on these issues. And it has been very helpful, Jim. You're on. Okay, thanks, Carl. I'm assuming you all can see the screen and uh, for Alan, I'll mention that this background is one of a series that Amanda Greenwell and Ulta have, have constructed for us to use around NSF. So this is all Ulta's doing. Well, not all Ulta's doing, since they didn't actually make the telescope. Uh, so I want to just uh, run through the impact on the major facilities. In the plenary session yesterday, I gave some brief background, so I'll, I won't repeat a lot of that. I'm first going to talk about the operating facilities as a class, and then I'll go through the construction projects one by one to let you know their status and what the impacts have been on construction and finish with a few general remarks. There we go. Okay, so, so first for the operating facilities, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, most of the major facilities in sort of the latter half of March and early April progressed through some phase of maybe partial operation into a shutdown of science delivery. Shutdown of science delivery doesn't necessarily mean complete shutdown, and I'll say a few more words about that in a minute. Um, still a number of facilities in operation. I mentioned most of these yesterday, and I want to point out that certainly for the radio telescopes and for the sensor networks, although they're operating, they're not getting the kind of routine regular maintenance that would have been done without COVID-19. And so what that means is that there are going to be backlogs of maintenance when people are fully able to come back to work or do site visits. And for instance, for the Ocean Observatories Initiative, some of the sensors are basically running out of battery life and shutting down. So those are gonna to have to be replenished. One thing I didn't mention yesterday is the high performance computing. Uh, Frontera, which is not actually a major facility, but is a forerunner of a major facility. And Cheyenne, which is a part of NCAR, are both parts of the uh, uh, National High Performance Computing Consortium for COVID-19. I forget the exact name of it. So they're both contributing in ways that they weren't necessarily originally conceived of as doing. Um, but the recovery after months of downtime for a number of facilities will be quite complex. And I will just walk through a few of the issues of impacts that, that will cause issues in recovery. So first on the operating facilities, we've seen loss of science and breaks in continuous data sets. So NEON is an example where you have long-term ecological monitoring uh, where people are not able to go out and collect biological samples at the sites anymore. So there will be big breaks in, in the long-term data sets for NEON. I guess since we're early in the history of NEON, maybe you might argue that's better than if that happened at the 10-year point, but it's still a significant impact. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Jim. Is there... Did we consider efforts to be essential or get waivers from governmental limits or were these non-governmental limits? Uh, Steve, let me, let me get through this slide and then answer your question. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, so there, there will be issues with awardee staff morale. People are working remotely, but people weren't always, weren't, weren't given a lot of warning that they were going to be working remotely. 
and when they return and people are trying to catch up on maintenance, then we're going to just have to be careful. The awardees will have to be careful on the overwork. There are hardware impacts, okay? Some that are obvious. Alma has more than 500 cryogenic receivers and they're all warmed up now. And when you cool them back down, you can bet that some fraction of that 500 are not gonna work right. And there are more subtle things such as that it took years and years to get the LIGO calibration to the point where they could detect the very faint uh, signals they were detecting. And in the latest operating run, they were detecting sources at a much higher rate because they had better sensitivity. So if they have to, if they turn back on after several months off, the question will be, how has that calibration stayed and what are they gonna have to do to get back to the sensitivity they were on before? Um, challenges keeping COVID-19 out of remote locations. Alan asked a question yesterday about Antarctica that I asked Kelly to answer. And so that's just, there are significant issues with just being sure that you don't get COVID-19 into locations where you can't easily get people out or can't easily treat them. Uh, facility upgrades have paused or slowed in some cases. So the natural hazards engineering research uh, infrastructure, they're doing a, a huge upgrade to the shake table at UC San Diego and that's being slowed down because people who are working on it have to work with social distancing. And finally, I'll mention future competitions. Okay, uh, NEON is, has started, we've started off a competition for management of NEON, except that that was to involve a site visit by potential proposers in March. That site visit couldn't take place without having the site visit, actually plural site, multiple site visits then non-incumbents would be put at an extreme disadvantage in proposing. And so that site visit has been deferred, which means the competition proposal due dates have been delayed. Now backing up to Steve's uh, question about, about sort of impact, this goes back to what I said yesterday in the plenary session, which is that we leave things to our managing organizations we're not really in a position to declare that some scientific facility is a critical element and override what some governor or local official knows is the right thing to do for their local area. And we have in fact at times been asked for letters. And if you imagine yourself being a, a state trooper in a state with a go home order and they somebody drives a car by and they stop them and they get shown a letter from somebody in the National Science Foundation saying they're essential, that would put the state trooper in a kind of awkward position. So we have in general not done that. And in general, although our science is very important, it's not critical to the national security. So I think making an argument about criticality of most of our facilities is, would, would be challenging. It would depend on the eye of the beholder. Yeah, I, the reason I asked the question when I did was losing continuous data sets, I almost cried. The other things can be fixed. And if you'd care to talk offline later, um, my day job is fully essential and we haven't had any trouble with state troopers. So if you have some time, let's talk about that offline. Yeah, okay. So let me move to the major facilities in construction. We have five of them, which I list here. And these are in order from the one that is closest to completion to the one that just started. And I'm gonna walk through these one at a time just very quickly. Uh, so first the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope. You'll recognize the image, which is also my background there. We got the first sunlight in January. The dome is closed up, the telescope is basically finished, the thermal system is just being completed. And what remains to be done is getting all of the instruments um, integrated with the telescope and commissioned. And that's where it stopped. So basically we have instrument teams that can't go up to the mountain and finish integrating their instrument on the telescope. Uh, so the telescope was scheduled to be finished in June we now will not make that. Uh, yesterday, in fact, the governor of the state of Hawaii partially lifted their 
stay at home order. And they even have a special category for observatories. But there's some back and forth now about whether that applied only to the big island of Hawaii or also applied to Maui where DKIST is. Uh, so Jim? we're very, very close, but we're not quite there yet. Jim Obestead, um, Jim, Alan Stern has written, has raised his hand for a question. This is Kathy McLeod, the executive secretary. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm just raising it for when Jim is finished. Thank okay, we'll, we'll get back to it, Alan. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, next is the Vera, Rubin Vera C. Rubin Observatory. It's over 80% complete. These pictures are from a presentation given by the project director to the National Academies last month. And if you look at the picture in the open, in the upper right, uh, you'll notice that they left for the winter and left the windows open. Uh, that's not necessarily the thing you want to do, but in fact, the dome was not completely enclosed at the time they had to quit uh, working on the dome. Uh, so we hope the Chilean winter is relatively benign. There are staff who are on the mountain who are doing drive-bys a couple times a week just to check things out and make sure the telescope mount is okay. Uh, but you know, that's a potential issue. Uh, for coming back to work, there will be an issue with Rubin Observatory, which is the two main structural items that remain, namely the dome and the mount. Two minutes are, remaining. Are actually the responsibility of, of teams from Italy and Spain. And so when there's a recovery underway, you'll have to get people from Italy and Spain, full crews to Chile. So it depends on them getting out of their countries, depends on the rules for getting into Chile, whatever quarantine rules there are, um, and then getting full staff up to the mountain to start over again. So there will be probably a, a relatively inefficient ramp back up for the Rubin Observatory. Regional class research vessels are about a quarter complete. In fact, they're in, at the shipyard right now, they're in a stand down on building the PNC COVID daily call. They're in a stand down on building the major structure because they're letting the engineering design catch up with the, the major structures. The shipyard, in fact, is doing, uh, also does work for Department of Defense. So the shipyard is open and there are components being built off, off site by contractors that are still being worked on. So right now there's no COVID-19, significant COVID-19 impact. In July, when they're scheduled to start back up again on RCRVs at the shipyard, we'll see what their status is then to see if there are any COVID impacts. Uh, Ames, this is the Antarctic Infrastructure Modernization for Science Project. Okay, this has potentially the biggest impact because of the issues with getting crews into Antarctica and the concerns about getting illness into Antarctica. So this construction season, actually the construction was stopped early and crews were brought back early because they had, to, they had concerns about their families at home. And so we really just couldn't leave them stranded on the ice. I think the last crew is scheduled to come back this week. Plus there were people who were scheduled to go down in March and April and work until June. And those crews did not go down because there was no assurances that you could get people down there and not be bringing uh, infection with them. Time. So there's a, a substantial impact there of losing part of a construction season. And we're still getting plans in place for what happens during the next construction season. Uh, high luminosity, uh, large hadron collider upgrade. So you have a new incoming board member who knows much more about this than I do, uh, Aaron Dominguez. So I'll just say that at your last meeting in early February, you authorized an award. The award was made on the last day of March. And we actually discussed at that point whether it was appropriate to make the award given that we could see impact coming from COVID-19. And the decision was made to go forward because the people on the award were already working on development. And so somebody was gonna to have to pay them anyway to keep the project running. And in fact, most of the work in the early stages of the award is design, simulations, software building, 
uh, getting material ready for procurements and so on, because obviously they don't have hardware to work on because they couldn't buy any hardware until the award started. Uh, so I think there's not much delay there now, but we could imagine, depending on how the next few months go, that there could be a delay. So if I look at overall construction impacts, we're seeing delays and in cost increases in some cases more than others. I'll mention the total project costs, which the board authorized were based on contingency estimation and statistical analyses for known risks that are under control of the projects. So our no cost overrun policy at NSF requires adequate contingency to cover all foreseeable risks. Um, but of course, uh, this is COVID-19 is realization of what is colloquially known as an unknown, unknown risk. An unknown unknown is not really the right descriptor because that just says you're not very imaginative in thinking about what could go wrong. What we really mean by unknown unknowns is risks that are highly impactful, that are completely out of control of the project, that they don't have the ability to manage and that we don't necessarily have an ability to estimate in advance. So we're gonna see near-term cost increases uh, for DKIST and Vera C. Rubin Observatory in 20 and or 21 possibly. Um, Ames will probably need rebaselining. Uh, there's plenty of money there now uh, because actually the pace of work has slowed, but the out-year funding will need to go on for longer. And that rebaselining, we really won't be able to do for a few months until we have a better idea of, of how people are going to get into Antarctica next season. So in summary, I think our model for these managing organizations has been quite successful. The managing organizations who have boots on the ground at the various locations are handling the challenge pretty well. The recovery is going to be complex but manageable. And manageable means, well, it takes money. I mean, there are gonna be things that are broken that are gonna take money and getting the construction projects on track is gonna take uh, increases in their total project costs. So we anticipate that over the next year and a half to two years, we'll be coming back to the board on probably several occasions to increase the authorized amounts for awards to cover our response. And I think that's it for me and I'll take questions. Jim, thank you very much. We are running very tight. So I'm going to ask that we try, if, if there are key questions, yes, we will handle them, but we are looking more to save time than to, uh, than anything else. So we'll open the floor to questions, Kathy, is paying attention and I'm hoping we will be able to go quickly through this part. Kathy? So Carl, you have questions from Alan and Anelia so far. Okay, let's go. go okay. Thanks, Carl. Uh, thanks, Jim, for a great briefing and uh, uh, amazing kudos for handling an unprecedented situation uh, and handling it well. Uh, I have two questions, uh, short answers will do. First, are there any facilities, for example, ocean going buoys or uh, uh, other ocean going, uh, where we actually expect to lose uh, uh, facilities permanently? And then secondly, regarding uh, the funds uh, to handle uh, these construction delays and maintenance issues, is there an expectation of new money or is this gonna be the NSS problem to solve internally? Yeah, so on, on, the, on the existing facilities, I think the expectation is not for major damage or major loss of capability. I think on the Ocean Observatories uh, initiative project, there are issues with these gliders out to sea and whether they're all gonna get back. Um, I think that, uh, one thing that people are taking advantage of, in fact, for the academic research fleet is that some of the ships have been rescheduled from science missions to actually long-term maintenance in port. And so I, I think those will be in pretty good shape. So 
nothing big that we see coming that's the unexpected that will get us. In terms of funding, in the end, funding has to be appropriated by Congress. And so we have basically sufficient funding in our 20 appropriation to do the work that we need to do in 20. And all future years, it depends on appropriations. If we will potentially have to ask for more funding in the MREFC account in out years to cover these increases. Okay, thank you very much. And Anil, you had a question. Are you I'm unmuted, sorry. It's a very trivial question. Um, actually, uh, Jim, as far as LSST is concerned, we have collaborations with uh, DOE. Um, <clears throat> is that going to cause, is that going to be helpful or do you anticipate any difficulties? Uh, the DOE camera, Anila, is 99% done. Um, mm -hmm. So the issue will be getting it to Chile and integrating it with the telescope. And obviously that's not gonna happen while the dome is open. So right. the, camera, <laughs> yeah. the camera is safe, safely at Slack and it will, it will get there when it gets there. Okay, so it's, it's really the ball is in our court, not theirs. Wait, what was the last part she said? <laughs> yeah, that's right, Anila. The ball is really in our court, which is we, we have to have the facility ready to receive the camera. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jim. We will certainly continue to be in touch as time goes on and feel completely free to contact ANF if there are places that you see that we can be of, uh, of value to you uh, as part of our job. Diane, yeah, I see a hand up. No, that was just a gesture. Got it. Okay, the next item on our agenda is a, uh, a written item only, which is an update on the Ocean Observatories Initiative. Uh, in the board book, there is a memo from uh, Bill Easterling, AD for Geosciences, that provides information on the performance of the OOI initiative in the first year of operations under new management. We uh, in 2018, we approved a five-year award to Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic Institute for Operation and Maintenance of OOI. In the award resolution, the board asked NSF to uh, have them to report back no later than May on the awardee's performance. Uh, the board's request for this update stemmed from concerns about the awardee's plans for data delivery cyber infrastructure, and community engagement. Are there any questions or comments about this written item uh, from committee or board members? Please use the raised hand uh, feature and Kathy will call on individuals. Carl, Vicki has her hand up. Okay, Vicki. Hello. Um, yes. So the um, external review, we pull, reported um, the results from um, a, a quite enthusiastic yet relatively small community of data users. And I was curious on what is the size uh, that uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, uh, size of the data user community they're hoping to have and uh, you know, what, what are the plans to expand the data user base? Carl, I'll, I'm, I'm joined by uh, Terry Quinn, uh, Division Director of Ocean Sciences, and Terry is on top of that question. So if I could just invite him, he's with us here. And so if I could just invite him to um, uh, respond to that question. Of course. Uh, Thank, thank you, Bill. And I might uh, bring on Lisa Cloud. She's here for the specific details, but the community is growing. It's, uh, it's engaged in that. And uh, part of that is, is being driven by this uh, new community engagement officer uh, that they've hired and also this, uh, um, the new user interface. So there's uh, uh, lots of progress being, being made on that. I don't know if Lisa is uh, on, Lisa Cloud, the section head. Uh, could, uh, if she is, she can add a specific notion about numbers. 
Sure, thanks, Terry. Uh, Vicki, we really uh, appreciate you guys' continued interest in the OOI. We really view the community engagement as a, the more users, the better, for sure. Yes. And it is kind of a three-legged stool that we have put in place on the increasing community engagement. So the facility itself uh, via the community engagement officer is, is certainly drawing in and making more people aware. Our uh, volunteer board, the facility board, uh, is the one that ran that survey. Um, and that was, uh, we were actually pleased with the response. Uh, yes, it was only a, a few hundred, um, but as you're well aware, survey research um, can be challenging when it's an open ask. Uh, and then there's also the Ocean Education Program and the education programs at NSF uh, writ large that have been funding, making some major awards. And, and so that article that we mentioned on the Green Grove at all, that's, there's a really robust user group of educators that are, that are being brought to bear. So I think that the, the couple hundred users that you're seeing both in terms of unique downloads and uh, also the survey response are not reflective of, of these very robust groups that are starting to come together under our sort of three-legged approach um, for community engagement. Okay, thank you, that was helpful. Steve Willard has a question. Steve. Yep, yep. Uh, I just wanted to briefly and publicly salute Vicki when she started talking about the engagement. I thought back to so many other major programs where you've done the same thing. So thank you for championing this and all the other community engagement, Vicki. Great. Vicki is smiling and thanking you. And I thank you too, Steve. We have worked it, in community engagement is really crucial in all of these facilities. And the, the new user interface from what we see looks like it's going to be an enormous step forward. And, I'm hopeful that we will, uh, that that will be reflected by the community when that happens. So, uh, Julia, a question? Okay, go. Yeah, um, this is very quick, and actually, it it falls between this and uh, Jim Olvestead's report on the impact of COVID nineteen. Um, in Jim's report. With regard to OOI, there was the discussion that two, I guess it's sensors or something, are missing, um, either either adrift or lost or something. Could someone expand on that and kind of how big a deal that is? Yeah, uh, Terry Quinn here. So uh, no, there are uh, there are two gliders that are uh, uh, that are one's adrift and and one has insufficient battery power, but that is not a. Uh, that's just two out of a large pool of, of that. So uh, we don't see that as a major issue uh, right now. Thank you. Others, Kathy, are we? There are no, no further questions. Good. We have a chance of ending very close to on time in that case. So let me thank all of you for the discussion and especially for keeping us up to date on the status of OOI. So I want to close this AF open session of the board meeting by noting that I, there have been a number of accomplishments that I will quickly say. Uh, our past chair two years ago, Peter Lepage, really stressed how ANF has to keep its eye on big picture strategic issues related to infrastructure and how it, as it fulfilled its uh, obligations to act on awards. In the past two years, I think the committee has done both and in no small measure, it has been a result of the real dedication and thoughtfulness of the vice chair, Vicki Chandler. And Vicki, we really appreciate all of the contributions that uh, you have made. Uh, both of us are rotating our, our term on the committee ends at this, uh, uh, this Sunday. I'm hopeful that uh, we might see you again later as well, but we will have to, uh, to see. Uh, so let me just 
uh, add that in this past two years, we've also seen a lot more engagement with the NSF Office of the Director. That has really made our uh, job much more uh, useful, I think, because we are getting information we, uh, that is invaluable for us. Uh, and the, finally, I'd, let me just note that I'd like to thank other NSB members who serve on ANF. Uh, Artie Beanenstock, Ken Fox, James Jackson, Dan Reed, Anila, and Alan Stern. But Vicki stands out as a really special person in, uh, in ANF. And the only other comment that, that relates to this is we can be no better than our staff. And we have an absolutely extraordinary set of uh, of executive secretaries and supporting staff. Uh, it's, it's hard to even find words to say how we could have done anything without the just marvelous support that we've had. Vicki, do you wanna make a, a comment on that or this subject? Well, I can certainly would love to call out the staff. Maybe before I do that, I will thank you for your leadership um, of uh, ANF these past two years. It's been uh, really uh, a lot of work, but a lot of fun. Um, I mean, the major facilities that NSF um, manages and uh, builds, uh, I mean, it, it's, I think uh, it's just been incredibly um honoring. Um, I've been incredibly honored to be part of the committee. Uh, you get a view into NSF that I think uh, not on this committee uh, is a little limited. So I would encourage other board members that are interested in the science going on uh, to uh, raise your hand to serve on this committee. Um, it's been great working with you, Carl, and the other committee members. And then the staff uh, the last two years have been great. Uh, Kathy McLeod, Judy Hayden, our newest staff member, uh, Jonathan Nguyen, Elise Lukowitz, uh, Brad Gutierrez, and Michelle McCracken. And then past staff uh, who we no longer, who are still, uh, most are still here um, and doing great work at NSF, but not with ANF directly, Leanna Avalon, Carol Bissell, Kim Silverman, and Mateo Muniz. So back to you, Carl. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vicki. And again, uh, we, we would not be where we were if it weren't for you. So let me at this point uh, conclude this session and uh, we will uh, go, go into a very brief break before we start at uh, in about 10 minutes in a closed session. So thank all of you and I will we'll see you soon. Thank you for this great session. Thank you, Jim, uh, for the presentation and for the discussion on OI. And thank you, Committee on a and for a wonderful couple years as a committee and for the leadership of Carl and Vicki. Thank you and see you shortly. I, before we all leave, I'd just like to know we're going to be going into closed session for ANF. So anyone who is not affiliated with the mid-scale award uh, on ANF, I'd ask that you uh, leave the meeting or others who are invited for ANF. Thanks.
We're streaming, Diane. Good afternoon. The plenary open session of the 467th meeting of the National Science Board is reconvening. I welcome foundation staff, guests, and members of the public. I'd like to begin by announcing the results of the just completed board elections. The board chair for the term of 2020 to 2022 will be Ellen Ochoa. The vice chair for the term 2020 to 2022 will be Victor McCrary. I'm excited for the direction of the board under this new leadership and wish you all the very best. I would like to turn the floor over to Ellen, our incoming chair, um, who needs to leave our midst relatively promptly. So Ellen. Well, thank you, Diane. And again, thank you to the whole board. And I'm really looking forward to this. Um, I especially want to thank Diane Suvain and before her, Maria Zuber. Uh, they're the two chairs I've had the pleasure to work under. And they both realized greater opportunities for the board to make its voice heard. They both fostered a productive and respectful relationship between the chair and NSF leadership, which serves you know, not only NSB and NSF well, but really the country as a whole. I'm excited to work with Kelvin, Fleming and their team, and of course, look forward to Punch's confirmation. They all bring not only a lifetime of service to science and engineering, but great enthusiasm for the impact of the foundation. You know, in my previous leadership roles at NASA, I was always fortunate to work with a team of really talented and dedicated people. And so I feel very lucky that, you know, that is really the case here as well. And I'm talking about both board members and board staff, uh, as well as, of course, the NSF staff. You know, we're all here because we have a shared commitment to the mission of NSF and to the greater science and engineering enterprise in the country. And we can make an impact as a board when we speak with one voice about the most pressing issues. You know, fortunately, we've spent time over the last year and a half to develop a vision for the future. Um, and that's really what's going to guide us in the next couple of years as to where we should put our time and effort. So I look forward to engaging with everybody in that work. And I'm excited to welcome Victor uh, as my vice chair in that effort. And Diane, if you'll allow me just a few more minutes. Um, Diane knows I have another commitment, uh, which happened because we ended up changing the time of, of this board meeting. And I had another board that also did that because we're, we're doing it remotely. And at the very end of this session, Diane has the uh, very bittersweet task um, of saying goodbye to some of our board members. And I'm very sorry to miss that, but Whatever wonderful words Diane says about those folks, believe me, I second it. But I did wanna take the opportunity uh, before I had to sign out um, to talk about Diane, since uh, as you all know, her service to the board and as board chair ends on May 10th. And so this is her last meeting. And given that our purpose is the long-term stewardship of science and engineering in our country, both this board and our country have been very well served by Diane's 12 year tenure on the board. She's been a committed, a knowledgeable and tireless member throughout and especially in her leadership roles as a committee chair, vice chair, and then finally as board chair for the last two years. She has influenced us, she's led us with intelligence, grace and good humor. And she kept us on a path where we can have the most impact in both our governing and advisory roles. And she's demonstrated the values of true leadership, integrity, accountability, humility, and she remained focused on accomplishing our mission and taking care of our team. What I also really admire about Diane is that she personally makes a difference in developing talent through her career in teaching and research with special insight and focus on getting underrepresented groups into computer science and math. If every professor did what Diane does, believe me, the workforce numbers we publish in indicators would look a lot different, <laughs> a lot more positive. Um, before I uh, close, I wanted to uh, turn it over to John Basie for just a few minutes to say a few words representing the board office. Thank you, Ellen. Um... From my perspective and from the perspective of the board staff, I would add that uh, being able to watch Diane's 
gracious, empathetic, and subtle leadership up close has, has really been a privilege. And I personally have learned an awful lot from her. Diane leads people by caring about them. I don't think she knows any other way to be on a team. In her 12 years on the board, she has done so many little things to express her gratitude and appreciation to staff. If you're not convinced, you can wait until for breakfast, her coffee mugs with the board logo on it show up that she bought for staff and for members of the board. And she cares about board members too. She takes the time to listen, to follow up on comments, questions, and concerns of all types. It is, is really truly inspiring to me that someone, someone with Diane's level of empathy can succeed at the highest levels of leadership. It shows a model that I, I certainly hope to aspire to. None of that means she's lacking in other leadership qualities. It just means that we as staff know she cares about us as well as the outcomes. And we know she's driving herself as hard as anyone. Diane, I know I speak for all of NSBO when I say it's been an honor to work for you and with you. We hope you won't be a stranger. Thank you, Ellen. So I'm personally very grateful to have had the opportunity to work closely with Diane. And thank you also, Diane, for helping to prepare me to take on the board chair role. It wasn't, as you know, something I was originally thinking about, uh, but I have a great model um, to follow. And I know I speak for the entire board in saying how much we will miss Diane, both personally and as our leader. So please join me in giving her a round of applause. Thank you for this time, Diane, and, and I regret that I will have to sign off. Thank you, Ellen, so much for your generous remarks. It's been an immense honor and pleasure to work with you. You're an exceptional leader, friend, colleague, human being, and the board is in very good hands. Good luck with your other meeting. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, John, for your amazing remarks on behalf of the NSBO. Working with you has been, all has been such a treat, and you are an exceptional executive officer and you'll make the job of the next chair and vice chair so much easier than it would be with anyone else but yourself. So thank you so very much. Um, I'm so very much honored. So let's now turn to the formal agenda. Um, before I do that, I'd like to take a moment to recognize a unique member of the National Science Board office, Ed Higgins, contacted the board office last year to inquire about the possibility of working with us as an intern, unpaid at that. Somehow, into our serious benefit, he found us and seized the initiative. Ed's a PhD candidate at the University of Oklahoma studying freshwater mussels. Together with our AAAS fellow, Michelle McCracken, they're probably the first one-two limnologist combo ever to work in the board office. Ed started his internship in January in the midst of our peak work effort drafting Vision 2030. You'd think he'd been in the office for years. He immediately made an impact. He did exactly what you would hope new eyes in an office will do. He questioned assumptions. He made us all think about why we were making this choice or that, why we were framing something in a certain way and what was and wasn't gonna be highlighted in the vision text. He researched, he wrote, and he reviewed. The vision's a much better product because it adds fearless and well-reasoned engagement we're grateful for his time with us, his contribution to our work, and wish him all the best as he finishes his PhD. Ed, on behalf of the board, thank you. The next time on our agenda is the approval of our prior minutes from the February plenary session. These are available in your diligent board book. Are there any corrections to these minutes? Hearing no corrections, the February minutes for the plenary stand approved as presented. I'd now like to give the floor to NSF's Chief Operating Officer, Fleming Krim, for senior staff updates and remarks. Fleming? I think you're on mute. Thank you very much. Uh, before the slides come up, I want to mention that in your board book, Amanda Greenwell has provided you with information on the legislative and public affairs activities since the February board meeting. 
Uh, I'd like to highlight the COVID-19 information and what we're doing there. And we've heard a lot about it and we've discussed it. Uh, and especially those interactions with Congress around that area. Her office is really critical in making those things happen. You've heard a lot about this during the past two days. So I hope you'll feel fully briefed. Um, also, please look at the information in that document on the anniversary of the Event Horizon Telescope uh, announcement. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the OPA report? Okay. <clears throat> now I'd like to introduce you to three individuals who've taken on senior leadership roles at the foundation since the November board meeting. Now, usually we have our leaders stand up at the board meetings, but at this virtual meeting, we're going to have to content ourselves with uh, looking at their photographs. Gurdip Singh joined NSF on March 2nd, 2020 as the division director of the Division of Computer and Network Systems in the Directorate for Computer and Information Science and Engineering. Dr. Singh comes to the foundation from Syracuse University where he serves as an associate dean for research and graduate programs in the College of Engineering and Computer Sciences and as a professor of computer science. Dr. Singh is his PhD in computer science from the State University of New York at Stony Brook. I know you're aware that uh, Dr. Ann Kinney, who has been leading MPS, departed on May 1st to become the Deputy Director of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, Ann pointed out that she'd spent 30 years at NASA and in many respects, this was going home for her. With Ann's departure, I'm pleased to announce that Dr. Sean Jones, the MPS Deputy Assistant Director, has agreed to serve as acting assistant director while the nationwide search, search for Dr. Kinney's replacement continues. And you heard a little bit about that search earlier. In addition to serving as the MPS deputy assistant director, Dr. Jones has previously served as the deputy division director in the division of materials research and as a senior advisor in the office of the MPS assistant director. During 2013 to 2014, he also served as the Assistant Director for Physical Sciences and Engineering in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. I was leading MPS at the time and I had to fight a battle to get him back. Sean was so effective in OSTP. Dr. Jones received his PhD in Material Science and Engineering from the University of Florida. Dr. Tia Luo, the Deputy Division Director in the Division of Mathematical Sciences, has agreed to serve as acting deputy assistant director for MPS during the transition period. Dr. Lua came to NSF in 2004 from the University of Texas at Arlington, where he was a full professor. At NSF, he has been instrumental in establishing collaborations between NSF and the Simons Foundation to support research on the mathematics of complex biological systems and on the theoretical foundations of deep learning. Dr. Luo received his PhD in mathematics from Brandeis University. And I'm very grateful to all of these people for stepping up to these leadership roles here at NSF. Diane, those are my Any comments. questions or comments for Fleming? Okay, let's turn then. Thank you, Fleming. Let's turn to the open committee reports. We first have the committee on strategy. All these sessions were held in the presence of the full board. So please provide just the highlights. Roger. Thank you, Diane. Yesterday, the committee on strategy received updates on, on NSF's FY 2020 current plan, NSF's coronavirus investments, including supplemental funding through the CARES Act and NSF's 2021 appropriations. The committee also, re excuse me, also received a highly informative presentation on the geopolitical role of the United States in the polar, uh, polar regions. A full report of the discussion will be in the minutes. I'd like to uh, finish by, uh, by making up, I mean, by saying something I didn't get to say yesterday. Once again, I'd like to thank the whole committee on strategy members, John Anderson, Vicki Chandler and Bud Peterson, who will be leaving the uh, 
our our group, um, and uh, they they have served an, in, an incredible role in, in the committee. Marine Condit, Tom Condit, Suresh Garamella, and Emilio Moran, Julia Phillips, and Will, uh, Steve Willard for their engagement has been great. I'd also like to acknowledge a former director, Franz Ochoa, I mean, Franz Cordova, and uh, and Fleming Krim, uh, Caitlin Fife, Tony DiGiovanni, and all leadership in fostering a strong collaboration with us over the last few years. And of course, I have to add you know, my thanks to the NSF staff. Um, including Kathy Jackard and, and Elise Lip Lipkovitz, and Executive Secretaries Teresa Good, Mary Koshkinen, and the late Karen King for the support of the committee during the past two years. Uh, again, I'm sorry that I get, didn't get to say that yesterday and in a, in a hurry to give up my slot. Uh, Madam Chair, that, that um, concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. The task force on Vision 2030, Roger Beachy reporting. Thanks. Yesterday, after the uh, official release of the NSB's Vision 2030 report, the Vision 2030 Task Force and the board had a very fruitful discussion about next steps on the Vision Implementation Plan. We encouraged the next NSB chair to keep up the momentum by standing up a structure that will coordinate the development of this plan and to determine roadmap items that the board can begin to undertake before the July NSB meeting. A full report of the session will be in the minutes. Uh, and I wanna take this opportunity to thank the task force members. Uh, Ellen Ochoa, our, our new chair, was uh, instrumental in, in helping to get this finished. Others that really uh, played a key role were Vicki Chandler, Bob Groves, Julia Phillips, and Maria Zuber. Both Vicki and Julia in particular uh, gave us lots and lots of feedback and. And, and words that we could use and concepts that we could consider. Thank you uh, all very, very much for the work that you did. And, uh, and Diane, thank you for, um, for your time that you committed to the completion of the task and all of the board members uh, who will serve on the, as, and we hope that this serves as a guide in the coming years. And of course, the NSBO staff and, and uh, NSF staff who supported, who supported the project uh, are, are, are uh, really commended. So Madam Chair, as this report is the task force last act, I recommend that the Vision 2030 task force be hereby dissolved. Before officially disbanding the task force on Vision 2030, let me express my sincerest gratitude and the gratitude of the board to the full membership of this group, to Julia, Vicki, Bob and Maria and Ellen and Roger, their leaders, incredible work. We are so very grateful to you. Your efforts will be forever documented in the rich report that's been produced. I now disband the task force on Vision 2030 with a deep thanks of the board. We move. We move now to the Committee on National Science and Engineering Policy. Julia Phillips reporting. Uh, thank you, Diane. Uh, the Committee on National Science and Engineering Policy met in open session yesterday. Um, we provided an update on the schedule for release of the final thematic report of Science and Engineering Indicators 2020. Uh, that report is on public attitudes uh, of, on science and engineering. And we also discussed planning for Indicators 2022, um, proving that no good deed goes unpunished, I suppose. Um, the committee heard from NCSES staff about opportunities for one-on-one -on -one training for new SEP members, improvements in state indicators, website, and impacts of COVID-19 on NCSES, as well as the federal statistical data system. Uh, the committee also presented the streamlined NSB review process for thematic reports that was approved by the committee to be used for the 2022 indicators uh, cycle. Uh, from there, we moved into a discussion um, with the board on policy topics to work on in the coming year, informed by indicators 2020 data and analysis. Uh, there were three broad themes that we discussed that were resonant with the key questions that were put for have been put forth in the board's Vision 2030 uh, uh, document. Uh, these were the importance of fundamental research, 
nurturing the U.S. science and engineering talent base broadly, and the need for the United States to be part of a global science and engineering collaboration. That discussion also further highlighted interest in topics that are related to unique needs and opportunities that are created by the COVID-19 situation. Um, and then finally, in closing, uh, we acknowledge the SEP um, members for their service, um, particularly uh, Bob Groves and Ponch, who are graduating from the SEP committee in different ways. Um, Bob is, um, is retiring as a member, but his um, knowledge of statistics and statistical agencies has been absolutely invaluable to me and the rest of the committee members, um, and we are going to miss that sorely. Ponch is merely graduating to another role within the board, we, uh, we assume, and so we will be able to continue to take advantage of his wisdom and boundless enthusiasm. And then the other committee members, Artie, Suresh, uh, Garamella, Emilio, um, Dan, Jerry, and Maria also have made innumerable contributions. And also I'd like to acknowledge uh, Diane, Suvain, and Ellen Ochoa, who frequently provided the margin that we needed to have a quorum during our telecons so that we could actually take a vote. So as, as well as many other uh, very constructive contributions. Uh, the NSBO staff and the executive secretaries have been exemplary and um, really enabled us in many ways to get our work done, as well as, of course, um, the partnership with NCSES. So we're, um, the committee should be very proud of all the results of the efforts over the last two years, and we look forward to um, considerably more progress in the co coming two years. Madam Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you, Julia. Committee on Oversight, Anila Sargent reporting. Thank you, Diane. Um, the Committee on Oversight heard an update on progress towards the 2019 Merit Review Digest. It looks as if we will have um, something to talk to you about uh, at the June meeting, and we will continue to update you on progress there. Um, the Inspector the Office of the Inspector General, Alison Lerner, reported to us that Kearney and Company, the audit contractor, will continue work during the pandemic. Um, her office was, had recently reached a settlement with Rice University in which the university returned $3.75 million to the government. And I should add that Allison um, has been appointed as a member of a committee for CARES, the Corona Aid Relief and Economic Security um, Act, and having established a pandemic response, response accountability committee. Um, in addition, we heard from Chief Financial Officer Teresa Grankovich. Uh, she highlighted the swift actions of her office in response um, to um, the OMB um, Office of Managing Budget Guidance. And she has taken swift action to provide um, really virtual outreach to the external grant community and provide support and information at this difficult time. And over, already over 45 million of CARES funding to NSF has actually been committed and obligated. We will hear more about this um, in July. And this completes my report, Madam Chair. Thank you, Anila. The Committee on Awards and Facilities, Carl Leinberger reporting. There we go. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. During our open session, ANF received a briefing on the effects of COVID-19 on NSF research infrastructure. ANF received a written item updating the board on the status of the Ocean Observatories Initiative as requested in the May 2018 board meeting when the board approved a five-year award to the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution for the operations and management of OOI. In the award resolution, the board asked NSF to report back not later than May 2020 on that awardee's performance. As a reminder, the ANF committee retreat will be held immediately before the next board meeting, i.e. on July 27 and 28. Full details of our discussions will be in the minutes. This concludes my report. Thank you, Carl. The Committee on External Engagement, James Jackson reporting. This 
Uh, the open meeting of the Committee on External Engagement featured a brief assessment of the NSB alumni listserv after a year of operations. NSB members agreed that the listserv is working well and is a good venue for sharing NSB activities and products as well as discussions. We also updated the board on ongoing indicators 2020 briefings. The primary agenda item was discussion of engagement activities for the board's new vision report. We shared the ideas that the EE committee uh, generated during its April telecon and invited the full board to suggest additional ideas, which they ent enthusiastically did. Um, I want to uh, tip my hat both to the task force on vision and also as well to the Committee on Science and Engineering Policy, because I think they've given this committee, the External Engagement Committee, enough work to last a lifetime uh, going into the future. So the committee certainly appreciates that. I concluded by asking that board members who are able and willing to help in these efforts to please let the NSBL staff know. We would like to keep engagement activities moving as board committees are reconstituted over the next month. And by the way, I also want to tip my hat to the wonderful um, staff, uh, NSBA staff I've had the pleasure of working over the last two years. That concludes my summary report, Madam Chair, and I thank you. Thank you, James. The next item on our agenda is approval of the annual executive committee report. This is available in your diligent board book. Do I hear a motion to approve the report? So moved. So moved. Second. 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 Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Thank you. The motion passes and the executive committee report is approved. As we near the close of this 467th meeting of the National Science Board, I'd like to share a few reflections from my nearly 12 years on the board. Certainly during this time, there have been innumerable, innumerable activities and decisions to which to point as accomplishments. For example, the board has authorized the construction and or operations funding of many NSF's current iconic research facilities, ice cube, Atacama Large Millimeter Array, ALMA, Ocean Observatories Initiative, Advanced Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO, and the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, LSST. And the board supported NSF's commitment to upgrade and modernize the foundation's Ar Antarctic facilities through the Antarctic Infrastructure Modernization for Science Program. In addition, the board established a number of task force and working groups to examine elements of NSF mission to include merit review, administrative burdens, mid-scale research, major facilities operations and maintenance, and broader issues on the skilled technical workforce and the value of higher education in the United States. This is an impressive list of accomplishments. What is more remarkable to me than the accomplishments themselves, however, is the steady way that the board has grown and transformed itself from 2008 to the present day. In order to produce these results, something that is a credit to each person who served or serves on the NSB or the NSBO. Significant challenges such as the Doozle, iPlant, Neon, and NNIN projects prompted deep thinking and the development of new mechanisms of interaction. And they required inputs from multiple constituencies and insightful engagement from all NSB members to reach resolution. And they encouraged introspection within the NSB on the nature of its responsibilities and how best to fulfill them and how best to generate positive impact both for NSF and for science and engineering writ large. Through the passion initially of individuals and over time of the collective whole, the board successfully and successively created the task force and the working groups mentioned above focusing on timely areas for the board's specific attention. It also undertook a complete review of its committee structure and activities, as well as its relationship with NSF and its overall statutory charge. Retreats and subsequent meetings both explored the difference between management, the responsibility of NSF senior management, and governance, 
a responsibility of the NSB and divided the roles of the board into the fiduciary, the strategic, the generative, ultimately producing a new committee structure and also built an understanding of preventable external and strategic risks that informed the development and publication of the board's risk philosophy and principles early in 2018 that now shapes the tone of the dialogue between the board and the foundation on the shared programmatic oversight responsibilities. This evolution, or perhaps revolution, of the NSB happened in close coordination with the NSF. Longtime observers of the board will recognize that the current strong relationship between the board and the foundation leadership is not a given, and it's not a product of happenstance. My predecessors in the board chair seat established a solid foundation with recently retired foundation director, France Cordova, one that existed throughout the generative activities just described, and upon which Ellen and I could build to continue to build with France and with Fleming. Just as the board is strongest when its members speak with one voice, the foundation is strongest when the board and the foundation leadership work together in their respective roles to further the agency's mission and support its outstanding dedicated staff. I shall be excited to watch Ellen Ochoa and Victor McCrary, together with Director Designate Seth Erman Panchanathan and Chief Operating Officer Fleming Krim, continue on this path. All of this set the stage for one of the most invigorating and challenging tasks undertaken by the board during my 12 years of service, the Vision 2030 initiative. First suggested by Roger Beachy at the July 2018 board meeting, it became the hallmark, pro hallmark product of my tenure, one in which each and every NSB member played a critical part, as did our NSBO and NSF colleagues, and where diverse backgrounds and opinions and visions have come into a cohesive whole. What stands out in this document is the breadth of its treatment of issues critical to the sustainment of US leadership in the global science and engineering enterprise. As a guiding light for future board work, it stands on the shoulders of many of the preceding reports and studies I mentioned above. For those of us in the class of 2020 who will be leaving the board, we should look back on this vision with pride. In my mind, it represents the best of what this body can do when the collective intellect and experience of its members is brought to bear on a challenge. I and my classmates look forward to seeing where this document leads the board and the foundation in the coming decade and beyond. At various points in the past few years, there have been discussions on the Hill and elsewhere as to the right size of the NSB. Is 24 too many? Should it be 18 or 12? As I prepare to leave the board, I would assert that 24 is exactly the right size. We need the breadth and diversity and the person power faithfully to execute the work of this board. And the ideas that have driven the NSB forward have come from inspired interactions among these 24 individuals. As I look now at my screen and at the thumbnail images of all of my fellow board members, I can recognize that over my time here, each and every one of us has been the one with a catalyzing observation in one discussion or another. Each member has been invaluable to the whole and we need all of us. So speaking directly to my fellow NSB members, whether those with whom I have served for 12 to 18 months or for 12, 10 to 12 years or any place in between, but especially to my fellow members of the graduating class of 2020, it's been one of the great privileges of my lifetime to serve with you in this most noble of undertakings. We've all dedicated our lives to the advancement of knowledge, being able to serve that cause for the betterment of this country's premier fundamental science and engineering research agency is a high honor. I am so very grateful for the opportunity that I've had to do so with you. And to my co-conspirator for all of my 12 years on the board, Bud Peterson, I had an extra thank you. I couldn't have chosen a more dignified, principled, and dedicated public servant with whom to spend those last 12 years. To the NSF staff and leadership, I offer my sincerest best wishes for continued success. I am confident that under the leadership now of Kelvin and Fleming, and soon of Ponch and Fleming, you will continue to do great things for this country. I celebrate your passion and commitment, and I will be forever indebted to the tireless efforts of those who kept the trains running during the 2019 lapse in government funding. And now to all who work under extraordinary circumstances to promote 
protect and preserve researchers, research and research infrastructure at all levels. These efforts exemplify the character of this organization and its people. Finally, I come to the men and the women of the National Science Board office. The office's mission is to, I quote, advise and assist, unquote, the board. Wow. Those three words don't come close to capturing the contributions this merry band of 18 makes to the board's success. Words seem inadequate to express my gratitude, admiration, and respect for the dedication and commitment each and every one of you puts on full display every single day. There's not a single thing this board achieves that does not have the board office's fingerprints deeply embedded in its fiber, whether it be travel arrangements and vouchers to catering for meetings and events, to talking points and background documents for board meetings and hill visits, to the invaluable liaising that you do with NSF staff and leadership in our absence, to the endless drafts of reports you prepare for our review and critique. You are all the engine that keeps the train running and I thank you from the bottom of my heart and know you will remain in good hands with the exceptional leadership of John Basie. So let me finish by saying what a thrill it has been these past two years as NSB chair and these past 12 years as your colleague. Thank you all. And in particular, I want to say what a pleasure it has been to be a member of the eight person class of 2020 that graduates in just a few days on May 10th. We have worked hard, made enduring friendships, and I believe are leaving the foundation in a better place than we found it. Who could hope for more? Unfortunately, we are unable to conduct our normal in-person farewell activities for the graduating class. In today's digital format, however, I would like to acknowledge the contributions of our outgoing members and give each of them the floor to say any parting remarks. Before I do that, I'd like to turn the floor over to Acting Director Kelvin Drogemeyer. Thank you, Diane, uh, for that just incredible um, set of remarks. And it's very gracious of you to allow me just to say a few words. Um, those of you who are finishing your terms today are a very special group because I had the privilege of serving with you for two years uh, prior to my uh, ending of my service on the board in 2016. Um, you're an amazing group of people, you really are. And Diane, extraordinary leader. Uh, Ellen, I didn't get a chance to work with you, but I see you in action and you're, you're really phenomenal. Congratulations on your election to be chair. Um, you know, the board, uh, it, it, it really exacts a huge time commitment on, on those who serve. It's not an honorific board. It's a roll up your sleeves, do the hard work. It's not an advisory committee. It's a governing fiduciary board that has a dual headed mission and responsibilities. And it's very unique in all of federal governments. Frankly, I think it's unique in the world. But the impact that you all have made is really just extraordinary. It's absolutely huge. Um, you know, there are a lot of smart people in the world but there aren't that many, I think, at least in my own experience, who are wise. And I think that, you know, the board has a lot of wisdom on it. And it takes not just intelligence to, uh, to govern an agency like NSF and navigate some of the really serious challenges, uh, but, but to, to lead forward in a very, very positive way to make NSF the bright shining star in the world that it is. It, it takes wisdom. And you really, really exude that wisdom. You see it constantly on display. So in my mind, you steward the best research organization, research funding organization on the planet. And I think uh, in my time on the board, and I think those of you graduating today would, would agree that the friendships that you establish on the board, the camaraderie of the board is, is really just quite incredible. And it's successful because in large part because of you. Uh, you know, NSF is what it is because of your dedication, your vision, your wisdom, your passion. We're all wedded together by, uh, by the passion of science. And the Vision 2030 document isn't just a plan for, for NSF, it's, it's a, I think, truly a vision for the country. And uh, the, the strong relationships, as Diane said, between the NSB and the NSF, it hasn't always been that way, right? I started on the board in 2004, and there have been some ups and downs, but I think it's stronger than it's ever been before. And so I really think that's uh, absolutely uh, extraordinary. Uh, I know you're going to miss being on the board, uh, those of you who are rotating off. Uh, it's <laughs> It's kind of, you go through a bit of a grieving process. In some sense, you're like, okay, I don't have to have all these committee calls. But on the other hand, you really miss it. And I know you will miss it. But I want to just assure you that your input and you is still uh, still very much welcome. You're still part of the community. And uh, we, we will turn to you uh, at, at various times, I think, throughout the coming years to really get, again, your wisdom uh, and your input. So uh, I, I just want to thank you for the privilege of serving with you. And thank you on behalf of a, of a grateful organization and a grateful nation 
for things that you've done. A lot of the work uh, goes unnoticed. It's behind the scenes. A lot of people don't realize that they see the outcomes. And, uh, and, and so it, it's, it seems kind of perfunctory to say thank you, but, but really um, those words are very heartfelt among all of us who are, uh, have had the privilege to serve with you. And with the new folks coming on board and the, those who are continuing, really looking forward to continuing to work with you. Um, the future is very bright, I think, frankly, a brighter perhaps than it's ever been. These are, these are times for us to be very, very encouraged. So I really want to wish uh, uh, the graduating class Godspeed in all that you do and hope that you'll stay in touch to the, um, the NSB alumni team. And I look forward to, again, continuing to work with you and, and just follow the great things you're going to do uh, in your lives and careers uh, coming, coming forward. So thank you very much, Diane. Thank you so much, Kelvin, for your remarks. I would like now to turn to honoring the members of the class of 2020, John Anderson first. When I think of John's contributions to the board, I think merit review and oversight more broadly. He chaired the Committee on Oversight and its predecessor, the Committee on Audit and Oversight. He was also deeply engaged in strategic issues, such as the board's work on administrative burdens I appreciate John's thoughtful inquiries into why things are done and how we can do them better. And I'm grateful for his continued service and engagement to the NSB, even after becoming president of the National Academy of Engineering. Thank you, John. Would you care to say a few words? If you are here, you are on mute. I'm okay now. Uh, thank you. It's been a great pleasure, Diane, working with you and the others. Uh, I didn't expect it to end this way. I was hoping for an impersonal uh, uh, meeting. Uh, I was going to buy a round of drinks for everybody, but unfortunately I can't do that. So uh, you'll have to invite me back to do that. And my, I really enjoy working with my class. Uh, we had a really good time. And I'm really proud of the fact that two are going to go on, Roger and Ponch, and Ponch is going to be the, the boss. And uh, a little bit we know that when we were in uh, Antarctica together, that you were going to be you were going to be the director of NSF. Very proud to have worked with you and all the and all the others. Also, want to thank the National uh, Science Board office. They're just terrific. One of the best groups I've ever worked with, and everybody at NSF. It's been a lot of hard work, uh, but I enjoyed it every minute of it, and I will miss it. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Roger Beachy. While Roger's reappointment to the board appears imminent, I want to acknowledge his tremendous service during our shared term. From planning board retreats to chairing the ad hoc committee on nominations for the class of 2018 to 2024 and the committee on strategy, Roger's been a consistent workhorse and leader of the board. He's been a consistent voice for the important service that science and engineering research can provide to society. Roger's leadership of the Vision 2030 Task Force is a suitable capstone to his first term and sets a high bar of expectations for his second. Thank you, Roger. Would you care to say a few words? Thanks, Diane. Uh, I, think I, I think I should take the time because if, if reappointment doesn't happen, I won't have another venue. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to, to, to serve on the board and to have the leadership that uh, first Kelvin and Dan and then, then the you and Maria and, and then you and Alan. I have it just been remarkable and something that I've enjoyed watching. Having come from such a diverse background, uh, I, I thought I didn't know what this board would be like when I when I took on the role, and and with France at at the helm, it it became what it is today, uh, a helpful, interactive, and collaborative group. I will uh, I will uh, assume I don't come back. I will really miss the opportunity for regular interactions. There have been some deep friendships that have that have begun as a consequence of being on the board. Um, the work was not always easy. Uh, it it was it, it stretches us, but again, we're meant to be stretched. Um, it's only by stretching together that we find the the, the loose cords and fix them, and and uh, and that's what I think we've helped to do in in, in the board. Uh, it's, it's been, a, as I said, a real pleasure. I, I, if I left when I leave, I will miss. I will miss it, and I will miss it all. So thank you very much for the opportunity to to serve. Thank you, Roger. Vicky Chandler. Vicky came to every meeting, every conference call, every committee meeting, ready to work and ready to share her wealth of experience to make our work better. 
she served on too many committees to mention. But her leadership of an NSB retreat and her contributions as the vice chair of the Committee on Wards and Facilities and on the skilled technical workforce and, and on the Vision 2030 task forces will preserve a legacy of caring about the people and the processes that make science and engineering enterprise flourish. A champion for women, underrepresented minorities, and a non-R1 academic environment. I will always be grateful for Vicki's willingness to assist the board think outside the traditional research box, as well as for her willingness to pick up the phone and provide wise counsel whenever I asked. Thank you, Vicki. Would you care to make a few words, say a few words? I'm going to try to not cry because <laughs> I'm feeling very emotional at the moment. Um, I really just want to thank uh, each and every one of you for an incredible six years. I have learned so much uh, from all of you and uh, it's just been great to work with you. Um, Diane, you've been an incredible mentor and supporter and um, Anyway, I can't thank you enough. Uh, I'm so excited about where the board, NSF, and the opportunities going forward with the Vision 2030. I know Ellen will be a spectacular leader to help really get that going uh, because momentum is gonna be so important. And I'm, I'm thrilled that Hopefully Roger will, will be reappointed and uh, he can help um, you know, continue to guide that. So I am going to have, uh, I'm gonna be sad, but I am going to be cheering from the sidelines, watching all the wonderful things that you all do with uh, under Kelvin and Ponch and uh, everyone else. So thank you all for a wonderful six years. Thank you, Vicki. Bob Groves, our resident statistician. Bob constantly reminded us that data matters and the great ideas can always be made stronger when there's data to back them up. His service on a number of committees, including the Committee on Strategy and its predecessor, the Committee on Strategy and Budget were invaluable. He was also a key contributor as a member of the Skilled Technical Workforce and Vision 2030 Task Force and brought his special expertise to bear as vice chair of the Committee on National Science and Engineering Policy during this period of transformation of the science and engineering indicators. His ability to see the larger picture and guide the strategic discussion has been one of the hallmarks of his service. I extend a hearty thank you to Bob, who unfortunately had to step out before this session, um, but he will, I hope, watch the recording of this and understand my health, heartfelt appreciation and that of the board. James Jackson. James, I hope you'll forgive me for getting a bit personal for a moment. You've been an inspiring force on this board. It would have been easy for you to withdraw to deal with more important matters, but you've continued to contribute and to lead all the time. Your service leading the ad hoc committee on nominations for the class of 2016 to 2022 and the Committee on an External Engagement, and serving on the Executive Committee with a ready willingness to answer the phone and answer at any time and advise, are indicative of your commitment to the board, the foundation, and the larger s &E enterprise. You also brought your A-game to the development of the board's report on the skilled technical workforce. Thank you, James. Would you care to say a few words? So off of mute. Thank you very much for that, Diane. I really appreciate it. When I um, agreed to uh, to serve and was appointed, um, I thought it would be interesting to find out how the sausage was really made. And um, I had some expectations about what things were going to look like, but um, some of those expectations were exceeded. Some of the expectations were met. So I knew I would be working with a lot of very smart people. And I got, I learned a tremendous amount over the last six years about all aspects of science. And I really, really appreciate that. Um, as an academic, you always want to learn new things. But what was interesting about this board under the leadership of Dan uh, in France and 
um, Kelvin, and then Maria, and then Diane, has been that I've learned that people on this board have been able to uh, set aside their egos, which is not always easy on boards like this, in order to work together toward a common good. And that's uh, actually pretty amazing. And as a psychologist, you know, I really, really, <laughs> really appreciate that. So uh, I've gotten a lot more than I've given, and I've greatly appreciated the opportunity to serve as a member of the board for the last six years. And Diane, a special thanks to you for all you've done. Thank you. Thank you, James. Panch Pachanathan. My first instinct is to say that I don't know what the first paragraph of the closing plenary script will be like without an accolade for Ponch to acknowledge. But since he's just moving across the hall on the 19th floor, we may not have to worry about that. Seriously, Ponch has been a tremendous colleague and a visionary thinker. He's never satisfied with what is, instead always searching for what will be better. His chairmanship of the Committee on Strategy played right into his wheelhouse. Ponch also served on a number of committees across the board, touching on education and human resources, the science and engineering indicators, oversight, and honorary awards. We were particularly fortunate to have his keen insights in the final drafting of the Vision 2030 report, knowing that he would be a valuable partner in its implementation as the NSF director. Thank you, Ponch. Would you like to say a few words? Thank you, Diane. Few words is what is very limiting to me. So but I will try to stay with a few words. <laughs> so first of all, I will say when I got into this board in 2014, I mean, um, this unbelievable group of eight people, I mean, this is just the best board that I've ever been. I can say that with absolutely no you know, hesitation whatsoever. These unbelievable group of eight people. And then I get the first call from Dan Arvisu welcoming. And I said, I've never seen a chair actually call and welcome people. And this is really a different board than I've ever seen anything else. And right then I knew that this board I will have a lot of friendships and most importantly, a lot of wonderful things to do. And most importantly, learn a lot more than I have ever contributed. I can say that I've learned so much in the last six years. It's unbelievable. It's, 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 it's you know, impossible to quantify. The only thing I can say is I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful to every one of the past members of NSB uh, classes, as well as the current class and the future classes. I'm very, very eternally grateful. It's been an honor and a privilege to serve with, with all of you. I will tell you, Diane, you are really an exemplar in terms of how to be a silent, but an amazing leader. I mean, you've really taught us how you can move mountains without having to have this, you know, the boring sound of anything. You just keep moving it forward. You're an amazing, inspiring leader. And thank you so much for all the things, your, your kindness and, um, and uh, you know, friendship that you've afforded over the years. Uh, I just wanted to say at least one word about each of my fellow classmates uh, to Bud Peterson. I tell you, I mean, you are you're a symbol of, I've always said, Georgia Tech president when I got in, I said, I'm so intimidated to even sit with the president of Georgia Tech is how I thought about it. I'm gonna be honest of how I felt. And then when I, when I saw the humility and when I saw his unbelievable leadership and what I learned from him was, I mean, I'll tell you, it's just amazing. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. And then when I, when I look at, for example, uh, Vicky, Vicky and I actually you have to understand, we come from two different universities who fight in the football field and the basketball field and everything possible. But I'll tell you, uh, you know, uh, Vicky is the most gracious person. And that's a, that's a word that I will describe Vicky uh, by. And, you know, she's such an amazing friend, so gracious. And our trip to Chile will always be etched in my memory. I just enjoyed it so much being with you, Vicky. And, um, and to Bob, I thought I took a lot of courses as a signal crossing uh, expert. I thought a lot of courses on probability, statistics, everything possible in data and a computer scientist. But I never knew that I had a lot more lessons to learn in the board through Bob. He's an unbelievable guy, amazing intellect. And the key questions that he would ask, I would say, wow, I mean, I, I mean, you can borrow this this way. I never could understand that. And he just taught me so much by how he, uh, you know, how, how inquisitive he was. And to James Jackson, the best way I will describe James is, he is the personification of kindness. I mean, all of you will agree in the board. He's so humble and kind. And he's such a, so, uh, it's amazing to watch him in action. And you learn so much from him. And no wonder he's a social scientist. You know, he teaches you kindness. And Roger is a force of nature. <laughs> I mean, my, you all know this already. How he got this vision 2030, you know, whipped all of us in shape and got that amazing document put out. He is really a force of nature. And I always remember Roger, Roger by the following thing, which I'm going to follow. 
is interagency partnerships, interagency partnerships right from day one. And um, to John Anderson, I tell you, this, this is the personification of friendship can be. We were together for that week in, in, in Antarctica with James and others. Uh, he's just, he's an unbelievable friend, an amazing friend, always rooting for you. And it's just, it's just I'm so, so looking forward to you, my friend, as a president of NAE, and looking forward to the opportunity of working with you more and to all of you working with you more. To the past chairs, uh, Dan, Calvin, Maria, Diane, and Ellen, thank you so much. And I can go on talking about every board member, but Diane told me I have to keep it brief. But you know who you are, who you are and you know, I know that I'm looking at you in the screen. I'm saying how much I learned from each one of you. I'm eternally grateful, and I hope to learn more from you and have the chance to interact more with you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Panch. Bud Peterson, I saved my longest serving board colleague for the last. Bud and I came on the board together nearly 12 years ago and shared an amazing site visit to Antarctica in December, 2010. It's been a singular honor to serve with you. Your leadership on the Committee of Audit and Oversight set the stage for the later successes we've achieved as a board. Despite the demanding commitments as a university president and commissioner of the NCAA, you were always there to serve when called. As I looked at the list of committees in which you served, there are few areas of the board's work that you have not touched. Oversight, strategy, budget, science and engineering indicators, nominations, and two terms on the executive committee. You've done it all. Thank you, Bud, for your long tenure on this board and for being a terrific colleague. Would you like to say a few words? You're on mute. You're on mute, Bud. On mute, Bud. Bud, are you there? Yeah, you'd think after 12 years, I'd figure this out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's a, thanks for the kind words. It's been an amazing experience to be able to work with you and the other members of the board. Um, I've had uh, probably a relatively unique experience in that I was able to serve as a rotator with the NSF in 1993. I'm not sure how many of the board members realize that, but I was uh, spent a year uh, at NSF as a, a program director when we were downtown and then moved to Boston. Um, so I got to see the NSF from uh, really three different perspectives. One as an investigator, a principal investigator. Second, as a, as a IPA uh, serving in that position and then as a board member and got to work with, as I said, some really amazing people. Got to work with the staff um, and see them from various perspectives and just a terrific group. I think this meeting is a, ter is a great example of what the st staff can do. I've, uh, like many of you, I've been on countless number of uh, Zoom blue jeans and Microsoft team meetings. And this one has gone remarkably smooth with up to at sometimes I think close to a hundred people that are involved in and online. And it's just gone, uh, gone very, very well. Um, the uh, colleagues, uh, as Diane mentioned, I started uh, on this board shortly after I became the chancellor at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And my interactions on the board with the other members um, had helped make me a better university administrator. I uh, am an engineer. I was on the faculty in mechanical engineering. I was a dean of engineering. I, uh, most of my life had been involved in engineers, uh, with engineers, and then I find myself in a position as a university chancellor or president and having to work across a broad variety of disciplines and being able to talk with uh, my colleagues on the National Science Board uh, that came from all a wide variety of disciplines help broaden my perspectives in many, many ways. And, and then finally, Diane, to you, I can't think of anybody I would have rather have spent the last 12 years with. Uh, we were fortunate to spend some time in Antarctica together early in our tenure, and that helped uh, create a relationship that has lasted for a very long time and has been hugely beneficial. So thanks to you, thanks to all my other colleagues. It's been a great experience. Thank you, bud. As we come to the close of this most unusual board meeting, I wanna thank the board office for the tremendous amount of work they put into making this meet sure that this meeting would be successful. I wanna thank all the NSF staff who collected materials, put together presentations and answered our questions. I also wanna thank all of the board members, old and new, for their participation. I wish the future iteration of the board all the very best 
I will remain a passionate observer of your work and look for great things from Vision 2030. And if there's ever anything I can do to assist in the efforts, please don't hesitate to ask. Is there any more business we need to address before we adjourn? Hearing none, I now adjourn this 467th meeting of the National Science Board. You, Thank Diane. You. Thank you, Diane. 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 Take care. Thank you. Take it easy. Buddy. Thanks, Stay Diane. Healthy, Diane. Diane. Bye. Thank you. Hi, Vicky. Bye, Thank Diane. You, Thanks very much, Vicky. Everyone stay safe. So same to you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Stay healthy. Bye.